well, it's my turn to be in front of the camera today. I much prefer to be holding the camera, but here goes. So Pippa tells me we've had a lot of interest in our tomato breeding trial and the dwarf tomato trial that we did a couple of years ago. And I thought I'd just, in this video, give an amalgamation of the two, just update you on the highlights of um, some of the results that we've, we've been getting without going into too much detail. And I'll save the detail for anyone who wants to ask questions in the comments. In all our trials, our main objectives are fruit with incredible flavor, plants that are particularly productive, and overall disease resistance, for obvious reasons. So with the dwarf tomatoes, the benefits of a variety for us being dwarf is that in our short growing space here in our polytunnel we can have a much more productive plant in a more squat space so we're limited by headroom here and a lot of the old flavoursome big uh, heirloom tomatoes are really big plants so they'd soon hit the roof and then spiral off in all directions and we'd probably get our first truss at about waist height or more and so we're limited by the productivity. So dwarf tomatoes, those internodal joints between trusses are much smaller. So more flowers in a shorter space means more fruit. And we trialed 46 different varieties and I'll mention a bit more about those in a second. The other part of our breeding program is for plants with excellent blight resistance. Again, for obvious reasons. Now our season here in West Yorkshire is quite short and it's quite humid at the beginning and particularly now at the end of the season. So we're at the end of September now and the sun is already dipping below the tree line of the hills that surround us. So even though we're nearly into October, because of our north facing site, we're limited by day length because of the surroundings. What we're after in all our trials are tomatoes that perform well for us and we encourage everybody to do the same on their own sites to produce productive disease resistant flavoursome tomatoes in the conditions that they have themselves so in other words through the breeding program if you develop one the tomatoes are almost self-selecting for the conditions that you're exposing them to so it's well worth a go so back to dwarf tomatoes. In our trial of 46 different varieties, we had some that stood out really well, and then some that stood out exceptionally well. And from those exceptional varieties, we incorporated those into our blight disease resistant breeding program, which is evident here, and I'll move on to that later. But from the 46 different varieties, we had quite a lot of unproductive plants. Lots of them were highly susceptible to diseases that we had here in the polytunnel, perhaps. Of course, I, I couldn't test for a lot of them, but where visible, say leaf identification or lesions on stems, then I could hazard a guess as to what they were susceptible to. So in the trial, we grew two plants of each variety. And in the results, I compared both plants, which were planted in different parts of the polytunnel or greenhouse. And I only made my own conclusions by comparing similarities, as opposed to where I had differences, I kind of eliminated that um, those conclusions. But if I had both plants performing exceptionally well, then I would make a note of that. And equally, if I had both plants of a different variety, both susceptible to the same disease, then I made a note of that too. So some of the plants that did really well included Veronia, Desperado, Purple Heart, Rosella Purple, and tasty wine. 
and others that did difficult to categorize, really good, as it were, to the point that I will probably use them in my breeding pro program um, in future years, were Adelaide Festival, Kookaburra Cackle, Ferdow Kofi, and Wild Spudleaf. Now, Wild Spudleaf, I'm not even sure I would class that here as a dwarf. It was highly productive, but it must have been about six, seven foot tall, and maybe that's still classed as a dwarf, but um, it soon hit the roof of the polytunnel. But it was so productive that we're definitely going to try that um, as part of our breeding program. But a lot of the fruit had blight lesions. So that's something that we'd have to iron out as through the breeding program. Another plant that I haven't grown out this year is Radini Lee, which produced huge crops, but suffered towards the end of the year from blight, uh, which again moved on to the fruits, which made them unusable. But I have hybridized that with our blight resistant plants. And so I'm hoping in future years to have a trial with those. So from our dwarf tomato trial two years ago, during that trial, we hybridized the ones that seemingly were doing the best for us at that time. And two that did really well were Sleeping Lady and Sweet Sue for different reasons. So Sleeping Lady was very early, which was very noticeable here. Out of the 46 varieties, it was producing sizable, ripening fruits far earlier, weeks earlier than any of the others in our conditions here. So alarm bells were ringing that that was a promising subject to use as part of our breeding trial. So during that year, we crossed it with our disease resistant hybrids. And this year we've grown them out. And I'll talk about those again later. So Sleeping Lady was chosen due to productivity, flavor of fruit and earliness. And we've tried to improve on its disease resistance. Now the other one, Sweet Sue, we really enjoyed the flavor. Beautiful fruit, but again, susceptible to blight. So we included that in our disease resistance program and we've grown that out again this year. So two years have elapsed since our last video on the subject and we didn't start with the trial in the ground in the polytunnel. We actually grew the plants out in five litre pots in the greenhouse and we pinched out two leaves above the first flower truss. So by doing that, we were able to maximize the number of pots in our greenhouse and there are some here in the polytunnel with one plant in each. And then we were able, able to compare large numbers of plants in a relatively small space. So we made selections based on those trials in the pots to then move here to the polytunnel where we could see how they performed in the soil of our polytunnel and alongside other members of that trial and other trials. After the last video, people were asking about the parent lineage of our disease resistance trials. Now it's a bit of a quagmire this area because of plant breeders rights, who owns what? But we basically did our research online and chose varieties that had two copies of each of three disease resistance genes. And then we used those as part of our trials. So we knew that in the F1, each of our plants would have at least one copy of each of those disease resistance genes. But we went a step further because quite often in breeding programs, the companies will breed deleterious effects into the plants so that if you were to save your own seed from the plants that they're selling, then 
all those genes all segregate out into the generation, the F1 generation from the seed that you've collected. And you can quite often get lots of spindly plants, disease susceptible plants, in other words, plants that are nothing like the original plants that you got from your packet of seeds. So we weren't sure whether there were any deleterious genes in the plants that we were using as part of our breeding project. So what we decided to do was create our own hybrid and use that to continue our breeding program. So we chose two varieties with as many disease resistance genes as we could research. And then we created uh, our F1 that we then used to cross with the other um, plants that we wanted to continue our breeding lines as part of our program. In our blight fight video a couple of years ago, we were talking about our Paul Robeson trials. So we were trying to breed disease resistance into a variety that we really liked and things were really promising and have continued to be so um, and I'll show some results of that here now into our sixth year so our F6 generation of fruit. So before I move on and show you some of the results from this year's breeding program I thought I'd just mean, mention some of the discussion points that Pippa and I had had about our tomato breeding program. And what we found is that everything in our F1 generation is disease resistant and produces a tomato that's edible and tastes good to reasonably good, some very good. But at the end of the day, what we want is passata for bottling, canning, and to get us through the winter to next year's crop. So it made us question, what the point in the breeding program was if we don't need to go any further than that F1 generation of which we have tons of seed and so I think we came to the conclusion that we would keep the most disease resistant breeding lines that we have going trying to get other people interested locally sharing seed and seeing what everybody else the results that everybody else is getting but I think what we actually concluded was that you just can't help yourself with the breeding program. It's just too exciting to wonder what is achievable at the end of the day, what's lurking further down the breeding line. And that's the thing that keeps us going. But I think my obsession is to keep hybridizing, breeding, trialing the tomatoes. But some years I fear that we might have you know a high level of disease incidence and then not get the crop that we need to preserve for winter usage so i think between us we'll come up with a solution but the important thing is that we don't lose sight of what it is that we need and that's the food to get us through the winter so let's have a look at the breeding program and the results that we have from this year's trials so here's a quick overview in the polytunnel. You can see lots of yellowing leaves on some of the plants. And as you'll see in a little while, there's some plants with hardly any yellow leaves. Now I'm going to try and keep this short, otherwise we're going to just be looking at lots of leaves all the time. But I just wanted to give this brief overview just to show some of the differences. So here we have a plant at a glance that has next to no blight on. And then if I pan over further down the line, you can see here to the left and right actually, that there are some plants that are clearly quite susceptible. But then we have to remember, we're also late in the year now. So you would expect the disease resistance to be breaking down, particularly when we've had some night temperatures at five degrees here. Also, what I would normally do is remove all the lower leaves to help the fruit ripen. But because of 
our work timetable this year but also because of the trial I wanted to leave the leaves on to maximize the amount of disease in the polytunnel to really select those that have the strongest resistance. So I'm going to move on now and show you some specific examples. So this is Iron Crush. Now this is actually our breeding line that we've been growing out. So it was initially a cross between two highly resistant parents and we've named it Iron Crush. As I mentioned before, make your own conclusions from that. But we're into the F4 generation now and the disease resistance is really holding out. And the reason we grow this out is because actually it's a very productive tomato by itself and it's quite tasty. And even though both parents basically just tasted like potatoes, they were so um, crunchy and tasteless, but the actual hybrid is, is really quite nice. And one other interesting attribute that we've discovered um, is if you can just focus in on the pedicels, there's very little to no abscission zone. So the fruit doesn't fall off. Now that might be a useful factor in breeding program, I guess. This keeps the tomatoes on the plant for longer rather than falling off. But I guess in industry tomatoes, it would be a bit of a problem if people picking were really struggling to uh, to to harvest the crop but i'll zoom in here look if you can see if anybody wants to comment on whether they've had similar tomatoes maybe it's not an unusual thing but that's one plant and then i have another one over here which is just showing the same thing so you can see there's a on some of them there's a partial knuckle which is where you would expect to pick the tomato, but it doesn't abscise from there at all. So you have to really um, use secateurs to pick them. But it is a highly productive tomato and, um, and quite tasty and definitely disease resistant. So this whole row here is one of the most exciting parts of our breeding program at the moment. And it's one using Sleeping Lady. As I mentioned, it's a dwarf tomato that produced really well for us, which is why we used it in the first place in the breeding program. And as you can see, it produces very highly productive plants and actually quite excellent quality fruit. Just move down the row. It's just starting to become susceptible to blight, as you can see on some of these leaves. But at the end of the season, you would expect that to some extent. But these trusses are really big and they're quite close together too. And they're all the way up the plants. So the internodes between the bunches is quite small. And the plants themselves are relatively short. So they're sort of terminating at about five foot. So perhaps. The dwarf qualities are still there in the tomatoes. So we're going to hopefully carry this one forward to next year. I've got a couple of plants that produce really large tomatoes and I might carry those on further to next year. So I'm just going to pan from these tomatoes here which are just succumbing to blight down to these three plants over here. Now they have fallen over because they're so heavy with fruit. But what I want you to see is the difference. So the plant on the left is obviously succumbing, but here the plants haven't got a single bit of blight on at all. Now, if I lift them up, you'll see they're quite heavy. This isn't great viewing, is it? But I don't know whether you can see all the tomatoes in there, which are actually quite big tomatoes so it's quite a hefty crop of really large beefsteak tomatoes now this is one that we 
I've only been trialing for a couple of years. So if I just move across, this is another plant here. And you can see really big beefsteak sized tomatoes. And again, very little to no blight on any of the foliage. And also the plants are quite short. But I think this is a um, what we call a determinate tomato. It's just a short bush variety. And this is one that we've been breeding for blight resistance. And it's one of its parents is ananas noir. And we really like ananas noir, but it always produces a few really good tomatoes on the lower trusses. And then everything higher up always seems to rot. So we've used it in part of our breeding program. And obviously we've got some hefty plants with a lot of fruit set, a lot of big tomatoes but it's late in the season, so we'll probably end up having to ripen these down the hill in the house. Again, if I pan across from the blighted tomatoes to this trial, which is another ananas noir cross with a blight resistant variety. And this again, this time we've got hefty crops, which you'll see in a second but we've got a mix of potato leaf and regular leaf tomato plants. Now there's six here, but all of them are highly productive, but very vigorous. So they look to me like they're indeterminate varieties. We've had to cut them off a couple of times. But if I move into the fruit, again, you can see large tomatoes all the way from top to bottom. Um, all of the plants all the way up um, but one one of the problems that we have this time of year i can feel already that the fruit is damp because of the condensation with it being cold the roof of the polytunnel is dripping and uh, what that creates is a damp spot on the tomatoes and as you can see here they get botrytis so they get fungal disease and it makes them rot from the top. So what I'm gonna to have to do, because we started quite late this year with moving house, um, the whole crop has been shunted to the extremes of the year. And um, so I think I'm going to have to harvest them all and then uh, ripen them indoors, which is usual for us because of our short season anyway. Um, and it isn't a problem. But yeah, this one, very impressed with this tomato as part of our breeding trial. And it'll be interesting to see whether they take on any of the other traits of ananas noir with uh, the striping red, orange, yellow fruits. So on the next row, which is a little difficult to get to, is our original Paul Robeson strain into its f4 generation now uh, in fact f5 this year so as you can see we've got lots of really good quality fruit what you could probably also notice is that they're all orange um, as opposed to the dark um, uh, color uh, coloring of paul robeson but again if i look down the line you can see there's lots of fruit I'll try and come back the other way. I hope this is easy to pick up when I play this back. But anyway, here we go. So there's a darker, a darker fruit here, but what you can see is lots of fruit and relatively disease resistant plants. In fact, these are interesting in the respect that they seem to be cropping like um, a determinate tomato now. And I'm sure Paul Robeson is indeterminate i'm sure somebody will point that out if i'm wrong but they're basically up to my sort of chest height um so this is definitely one i'm going to carry through to a further generation just through to productivity and if i get started earlier in the year probably can beat the blight um, before it gets to this level so at this end of the polytunnel we've got our what I'm calling Iron Sioux trial, 
which is using the Dwarf Tomato Sweet Sue. And so we're into F3 generation here, and all bar one, which is still is terminating at about five foot, is seemingly of that dwarf kind of nature, which is great. But what is interesting to me more is the variations in the fruit. So I think there are about 10 plants and all bar two. So this is typical of the eight tomatoes. So again, these are green, obviously, but we're ripening some ripening at the bottom. But as again, a lot of this is my fault for sowing so late. But you can see they're just sort of salad sized tomatoes. But then two plants like its neighbor here are quite substantially different. If I can just get them, bring them out, pull a few leaves off. So this is more like it in terms of um, the cropping potential that we're after. Um, and the color is obviously very different, but further down the line, we might get some more yellows. In fact, I do have uh, the other one that's large is yellow, um, but an orangey yellow, not quite as clear yellow as the original Sweet Sue. Um, so plenty of fruit on here. And this is also another one adjacent to it with, with large beefsteak type tomatoes and a good crop. And so from top to bottom, this one's only about four foot tall. Um, so definitely worth trialing those again next year. The other thing I've done in here is not give them as much space as I would have liked because I was quite late planting. I put them much closer than I normally would. I also didn't pinch out like I haven't been with the dwarf tomatoes to see what would happen. And actually, I've just strung, I've put them on single. Um, strings from the top of the polytunnel down and then I've tied as the plants have grown I've tied little loops around to keep them contained and that's all the kind of training that I've done and it's been fine on any of the plants um, but obviously for air circulation and for ripening of fruit then it would probably be better to do some pinching out of some of the varieties but I don't really want a variety that needs, requires that amount of attention because I don't really have that amount of time on my hands. So that's another one of the advantages of dwarf tomatoes um, is it gives you that added potential for less work in your uh, tomato growing. What I like to do here before we harvest is obviously label the fruit. Now this one's ripe, but I'm going to be picking a lot of green tomatoes today and ripening those in the house. So I've got my little cloth, which I just like to wipe off the condensation, which again is a result of the high humidity in here, and also a reason why we're having more botrytis than I'm happy to uh, put up with. And then I write the code on. Uh, the tomato so I know which plant, which part of the trial it's coming from and any other information that I think is relevant and then I can save the seed and then continue the trial next year. But what we'd really like to do is share the seed with other people so they can go and uh, grow them out, share the results, share the seed. Obviously we're limited to the UK because of current export restrictions but it'd be really good to hear how these varieties perform in other locations because as I spoke about at the beginning of the video we're self-selecting these varieties to the conditions that we're growing in but equally we think that the um, if they grow well in our low light north facing site how well will they grow in a sunnier spot somewhere else in the country it'd be good to know so hopefully in the comments we'll make some notes as to how people can um, uh, get hold of some of this seed and, uh, and share the results. But now I'm going for lunch and then when we get back 
we're going to strip all the tomatoes off the plants, green ones included, and then see what kind of crop that we have this year. Thank you.